Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Graduate Institute for the 2020 ceremony of the GEL Challenge. Let me start with a personal note. For the last 10 years or so, I've followed quite closely, but from afar, the Geneva Challenge. When I was at ESSEC Business School, and more recently at the School of Management and Innovation at Sciences Po, I've encouraged our students to participate and to get involved in the challenge. The challenge particularly inspired me when I joined Sciences Po and launched the School of Management and Innovation there. And I said that to Ambassador Stalin already, I copied the challenge. <laughs> I decided to create our own internal challenge. All 500 students of each incoming class work from team in teams of four to five students over a period of six months on the development and deployment of solutions to key issues and challenges of our world connected to one of the SDGs. I liked to urge them in that context to be realist utopians, to think, but also to dream also to act all at the same time. So you can imagine how happy I am to be here today in, with the real thing at the real place. The challenge this year is that, is that of social inclusion. Inequality, we know that, is one of the plagues of our modern world. And this plague is multidimensional. It is often thought about and discussed in economic terms and symbolized through the striking figures that show a widening gap between the richest on the one hand and the poorest on the other. But economic inequalities are driven by and they drive in turn profound social disparities. It's quite clear that in many cases today we need an intersectionality lens to understand economic inequalities. Across the world, gender, race, caste, ethnicity, religion, or disability status are common identity features that contribute to economic marginalization. And economic marginalization, on the other hand, further contributes in turn to social exclusion. Being poor also means tendentially having less access to education, to health, but also to opportunities for socialization. Being poor implies in time being less embedded in networks of friendship, support, or even a weakening of family ties. And we know that those support systems are important to create job and economic opportunities and to escape from the dramatic dynamics of economic and social exclusion. Being poor also often implies being more lonely and therefore vulnerable as the two go together. Some researchers even say that loneliness today kills more than obesity. And in any case, it has a negative impact on health, both physical and mental. The society weak on social inclusion, furthermore, is going to be more prone to what the sociologist in the time called anomaly and its modern political consequences. As many social scientists and philosophers, including Anna Arendt, amongst others, showed loneliness is a fertile ground for totalitarian politics. And it's not the current state of our world that will contradict that. Hence, social inclusion is indeed an urgent and highly relevant topic to be working on today. Leave no one behind is the central and transformative promise of the 2030 agenda. And this promise should be the guiding compass of decision makers across the world. And it should also be our own compass, us educators, as we train the new generations of decision makers will be in charge of building the more inclusive and sustainable world that is so urgently needed. There were this year 366 teams in the challenge with a total of 1,368 graduate students from 102 different countries. 144 project entries were submitted with 17 semi-finalist teams this year. The jury panel chose five finalist teams, one per continent. They should have been with us here in Geneva, but we had to move this edition online. I don't need to explain one. And I would like to greet and thank all the participants who are joining us from all over, all over the world, as well as their friends and families who are with us today and following online. I also would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Ambassador Stelling, who came up with the idea of the challenge a number of years ago 
and has been its undefectable champion ever since the first edition in 2014. I would like also to thank jury members for their essential role and involvement and our academy uh, steering committee members um, also for their essential role and involvement. Before we launch, I'm sorry, there's something missing in my thank you. I want to thank the organizing team and Lena and all the team around her at the Institute because organizing such an event in itself is already complicated, but this year, you know, the complication was certainly uh, increased. So thank you very much to all of you. Before we launch the award ceremony, and I'm sure that you're all impatient to know the results, we have the immense honor to have with us President Juan Manuel Santos. President Santos was the president of Colombia from 2010 to 2018 and recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016 for its resolute efforts to bring the country's more than 50 year long civil war to an end. President Santos was one of the initial promoters of the SDGs for its strong environmental policies to protect the country, its country's biodiversity and fight climate change. He was awarded the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew International Medal and the Wildlife Conservation Society Theodore Roosevelt Award for Conservation Leadership. Furthermore, the National Geographic Society honored him for his unwavering commitment to conservation and conservation, and Conservation International awarded him the Global Visionary Award. He's currently chairman of the Board of Compass Foundation, which he created to promote peace, to protect the environment, and fight poverty. He is also part of the Elders and the Global Commission on Drug Policy, as well as a member of the board of the International Crisis Group and the Wildlife Conservation Society. President Santos' presentation on the challenges of social inclusion in a post-conflict environment will be followed by a discussion between President Santos and Martina Villarengo, who is the president of our academic steering committee, which I mentioned before, and associate professor here at the International Economics Department at the Graduate Institute. President Santos, thank you very much for your presence, at least your virtual presence, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are you hearing me right now? Yes. Okay, well, good afternoon to you. Uh, it's good morning to all who are in my time zone. It's a great uh, honor and pleasure to be in this event to talk about uh, the importance of social inclusion in the conflict and post-conflict areas. And I would like to share with you uh, my experience here in Colombia. When, when I was planning the peace process, I understood since the beginning the importance of uh, what uh, is called the objective uh, causes of revolution uh, in order to address uh, the guerrillas and to try to convince them to lay down their arms and continue their struggle through democratic means. So I knew that since the beginning I had to uh, address this issue and at the same time, the negotiation. And, and that's what I did. And uh, we started a, a process of recognizing the victims. This is something very important in the process of, of uh, uh, resolving an armed conflict. Um, no, other, um, no other place, no other process has recognized and put the victims in the center of the negotiations. And so we did that through a law, uh, even before we started the official negotiations, to recognize the victims and recognize the armed conflict, because that was what will, would give us the legal basis to apply what is called transitional justice in order to be able to achieve peace. Transitional justice is another type of justice that uh, seeks to uh, repair the victims and uh, to restore uh, the moral fiber of society after war. And so we approved this law 
that recognized the victims. And we started even before the negotiations to give back to the peasants the land that was taken from them through violence. So this is, was a very important law. Even the, the then Secretary General of the United Nations went to the signature of this law and said, this is unprecedented. This is a very good example for the rest of the world. And uh, we started to apply that law. We then started the negotiations. And at the same time, I had the uh, blessing and the uh, coincidence of being a student many, many years ago of a noble uh, uh, economic laureate, uh, Professor Amartya Sen. Uh, he was my professor at the London School of Economics and at Harvard University. And he had a theory that we should address poverty with a different approach than had been used by the world, by the Monetary Fund, uh, by the World Bank, and that we should address poverty uh, in a more comprehensive way. So I called him and I said to him, Professor Sen, this is your former student. I want you to help me uh, because I want to address the objective causes of this conflict. And he was very excited about it and he helped me. And we constructed something called the multi-dimensional index. Uh, Colombia was the first country uh, to construct this index in order to address poverty not by how much money you earn, but what are your basic needs? What is it that you need to have a, a dignified life? And uh, we started to construct this index according to our own uh, needs and our own conditions, and then to use the index. And that was very, very helpful because we started to identify where the social investment should be concentrated in order to have the highest impact in our fight against poverty and inequality. And that's how we started a series of social programs. Um, for example, uh, in health, we declared health a fundamental right for every Colombian. And that was a big, big step in our social policies. I declared education free for every uh, boy and girl from kindergarten to 11th grade uh, in the public schools. That was another big step in our social policy. We started to address something which is extremely, extremely important to any country uh, that wants to have more social inclusion and more equality, early childhood. Uh, investment in early childhood is the most uh, profitable, socially profitable investment any country can make. And we even brought a Nobel laureate uh, from the University of Chicago to launch the program in Colombia. We discovered that the quality and access to housing had a tremendous impact in uh, fighting poverty. So we started a massive program of uh, giving, especially the poorest of the poor, uh, a house, a free house. Um, and uh, that was something unprecedented, but it had a very, very big impact, not only from the social point of view, but also from the economic point of view, because construction is very labor intensive, so at the same time, this was very helpful to fight unemployment. We uh, also uh, addressed the, uh, the problem of access to higher education. We increased that in a very important way. Um, and we started a very uh, important program, uh, program to bring infrastructure to those remote areas of the country that had never been seen or felt the presence of the state. So uh, with this approach, uh, we were able to address uh, the, the fundamental causes uh, that the guerrillas said that 
was the reason for them to uh, to fight a, a war that lasted more than 50 years, more than 9 million victims, more than 250,000 people dead. And at the same time, we uh, negotiated with them a post-conflict, and this is the most comprehensive peace agreement ever negotiated in the history of the world to resolve an internal armed conflict. Uh, we gave ourselves 15 years in order to implement the agreement, and uh, a basic uh, part of, of the agreement was what we call the rural reform. Uh, in Colombia, as in many, many countries, poverty and inequality is concentrated in the rural areas. And so bringing development to the rural areas was extremely important. And uh, we negotiated, and this is part of the agreement, uh, 17 different development plans, but with something very important. It was the people, the people of those areas who chose the priorities that they would want the state to invest in. And so it's it's a, a process of from the bottom up instead of from, from the top down. And that has been a very important democratic exercise. And the programs are right now starting to be implemented. And, and that has had so far a tremendous and very important result, uh, especially the concentration of the social investment in the uh, specific plans that we uh, we uh, identified, allowed us to uh, to reduce uh, extreme poverty uh, to half. I have some figures here that I would just like to share with you. The multi-dimensional poverty, the ones that we started to a measure, it's a different matrix, went down from 30.4% to 19.6%. The, the traditional poverty, how it's usually measured in every country, went down from 37% to 27%. And as I said, extreme poverty went down to, uh, it was cut by half. And something extremely important, and which is, uh, one of the best results is that we started to reduce inequality. Colombia was one of the most unequal uh, countries in the world. Um, and uh, that was something that worried me and worried many, many people. And so we were able to bring down uh, the so-called GD coefficient, which uh, measures the inequality, bring it down uh, substantially but uh, still, still today, extremely, extremely high. Um, but this is uh, a, a, a good start of what we did. Now, that helped very much uh, to create a more uh, acceptable environment for signing the peace. And so uh, the guerrillas disarmed, uh, it was the oldest, and the strongest guerrilla in the Western Hemisphere, the FARC. Uh, they gave their, up their, their arms, they disarmed, they gave their arms to the United Nations, and they started to reintegrate into society. The big challenge now is precisely to implement the agreement and to continue uh, these social programs. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we are going back some say 20, 30 years. Uh, poverty will go up, uh, it, will, it will wipe out all what we have done in the last 10 years. Um, extreme poverty the same, unemployment the same. Colombia is right now with a very, very high rate, the highest in Latin America of unemployment. And so we are going to have to redouble our efforts. But the experience we had in the last uh, decade uh, and how we applied this multi-dimensional index and how we prioritized with the people, uh, the social programs will give us a very uh, good uh, uh, path uh, to 
not only repeat, but to uh, multiply in order to hopefully uh, get out of this pandemic and as they are now mentioning, build back better. Now, there are things that we have to address that were not addressed before. Uh, one, of the, one of the programs that for me was so important was the environmental uh, policy. Colombia is one of the richest countries in the world in terms of biodiversity and, uh, and the water and, uh, and the environment in, in general. Uh, we need to uh, transfer our energy from fossil fuels to uh, renewable, renew, renewable fuels and renewable uh, energy. And we need to address with even more uh, determination the inequalities and come back, hopefully, to be uh, a bit better than what we were before the pandemic. Um, and this is absolutely fundamental to maintain the peace because uh, we are still struggling with the post-conflict uh, uh, dilemmas of a war of more than 50 years. Uh, the wounds that uh, a war of this nature uh, has in society take time uh, to heal. And uh, part of the way that uh, you heal the wounds is to bring uh, progress and development, especially to the victims and to the people who suffered more uh, during the war. And uh, that's what is we have as a, as a big challenge. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has, has created uh, a lot of obstacles in order to continue that. But this is the big challenge for Colombia and for any country that uh, has a post-conflict situation. So to finish up, uh, what I would tell you is that uh, to address the so-called subjective, uh, objective causes of revolution or the root causes of social protest in a situation of conflict is fundamental to be able to resolve that conflict and have a, a durable peace. Uh, and this is something that uh, in many, many parts of the world uh, needs to be done. And especially now that uh, this pandemic all around the world is going to aggravate the differences, the inequality, uh, the problems of poverty and extreme poverty. And so uh, we have a big challenge, uh, uh, but we have also a good example of how we did it. It worked and we must repeat it even with uh, what we have learned during these 10 years and what the pandemic has shown us uh, in order to be able to be more effective in addressing the great challenge of social inclusion. Um, this is not only a problem for Colombia, it's a problem for the whole world. And uh, this pandemic, unfortunately, uh, revealed that uh, uh, the inequalities are even much bigger than we thought, uh, revealed that the vulnerable uh, uh, segments of society um, are more vulnerable than we thought. Uh, one specific example are the indigenous communities. These have been very, very badly hit by the pandemic. Um, and uh, they are, among other things, the guardians of our, of our biodiversity, and we need to protect them even more than other uh, sectors of society. So we have a big challenge, uh, but we have examples of how uh, new policies can work, and uh, we need to address uh, these challenges with optimism, um, I truly think that uh, uh, we will go out of this pandemic uh, hopefully stronger than we were before uh, and with more instruments and elements to address the fundamental problems of the world and of Colombia. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, President Santos, for this very insightful and valuable talk. Um, let me ask, start by asking you a question about the pandemic. Um, 
The COVID pandemic is increasing inequality among countries and within countries. Um, as you discussed, both unemployment and poverty rates have been rising in the past months in Colombia, undermining social improvements of the past decades. We're losing ground on the sustainable development goals. Can we save the SDGs? And what do you think can be done to lessen the social and economic impact of the pandemic? Well, the SDGs are uh, something that is very close to my heart because Colombia was the country who uh, proposed to the world the SDGs back in the year 2012 in the Rio Plus 20 summit. And so we have been very much involved with the creation of the SDGs and the implementation of the SDGs. And what I would say is that, uh, yes, the pandemic has, uh, has uh, forced us to go back but the SDGs are a marvelous instrument to fight back the pandemic, the consequences of the pandemic. Uh, they, they combine the social and the environmental component, and uh, we need to be able to sell to the whole world that the biggest challenge that we have is not the pandemic, it's climate change. And uh, hopefully what we can take out of this pandemic is that uh, giving more importance to science and to the evidence will allow us to build back better, will allow us to be more effective. Yes, it will take time. Uh, we will need many years to recover from the social effects of the pandemic, but we need to do it anyways but we should do it then better. And so I am, I think the SDGs, uh, yes, we will be uh, going backwards. Uh, the results will be very bad, but they are an extremely good instrument to then go forward. And I think this is something that the world needs to, um, to understand. Uh, and it's also the only, the only, agenda that the whole world adopted uh, unanimous, unanimously in the United Nations in this world where multilateralism is unfortunately being weakened. We should reverse that trend because as has been said with the pandemic, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And if we understand that, uh, the other problems, the social inclusion problems, will also be uh, uh, less difficult to address when we understand that we all live in one house, in one planet. Thank you. Um, Colombia is one of the countries in Latin America with the lowest levels of gender gaps. Gender gap in education attainment and gender inequalities in health and survival have almost entirely closed. Yet, gender differences persist in economic participation and political representation. What more can be done to close these gaps and foster women's empowerment? How do you see the way forward? Yes, um, the gender issue was even addressed in the peace agreement. It was the first peace agreement in the history of the world that has a special chapter about the role of women in the post-conflict. And why did, we do, why did we do that? Because usually the more victims of the victims are women in wars. And we needed to give women, empower women in the post-conflict. So they are playing uh, a very important role in the implementation and in the post-conflict. We also, at the same time, addressed uh, the issue legally. Uh, we uh, passed many laws to abolish any kind of discrimination. I even uh, made the discrimination uh, 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 a legal problem, a penalty, a, a legal penal uh, 
a problem for anybody who discriminates, but there's always a difference between the law and the attitude of the people to comply, to accept this law. So we need to start to continue to persevere in, in, this, uh, in this direction. Uh, we have progressed tremendously, but we need more progress. We still have uh, differences between women and men uh, uh, working in the same uh, type of work. Uh, we still have an underrepresentation of women in, in many areas, even though Colombia, I must say, is quite more advanced than many of the countries in the region. The peace process you led is increasingly referred to as a model for inclusive peace. There are also some current challenges. Um, could you tell us something more about what surprised you most about the process and what happened that you least anticipated? Well, one of the lessons I learned was the generosity of the victims. We had many victims, nine, more than 9 million victims. And when I started the peace process, a professor from Harvard came to me and visited me and said, President Santos, you're undertaking a very difficult path that uh, will need to re-energize you many times because you, you will feel that you're about to throw in the towel, say no more. It's going to be very difficult. You're going to feel very lonely. And he said to me, talk to the victims. They will re-energize you. So uh, as a matter of a discipline, I started talking to the victims, hearing their dramas. Uh, and uh, I not only was re-energized when I said, I must finish this war because I don't want more people to, to, to suffer as these people have suffered. But also, I was very, very pleasantly surprised because I thought that the victims, because they were victims, were going to be the, the ones that would oppose more transitional justice, giving legal benefits to people who had committed all kinds of atrocities. And I discovered that it was the contrary, that they were the ones who said, no, you have to continue. You have to give them the benefits if that is going to bring us peace. And for me, that was a marvelous lesson of life, the generosity of the victims. And uh, therefore, I, I, I learned that uh, by having putting the victims in the center of the peace process and of the post-conflict is the best way to uh, reconcile. And uh, reconciliation is the most difficult part of any peace process. All peace processes uh, divide between peacemaking, which is signing the agreement, giving up the arms, uh, reintegrating the insurgency in society, but then peace building. That takes a lot of time because it takes a time to heal the wounds. And uh, I will tell you a very short anecdote. Uh, the Pope, the Pope, we became friends and I visited him very often in, in Rome and I used to tell him, why don't you come to Colombia and give me a, a push? I need some help. And he used to say, don't worry, President Santos. I pray uh, a lot for you. And I said, my God, if you have to pray for me, I'm in deep trouble. And uh, he said, no, I will go when you and the Colombians will, no, will most need me. And he came to Colombia after the, the, we had signed the agreement, after the guerrillas had given up their arms, and he himself uh, put the title of his visit. I took, I go to Colombia to push the Colombians in this very difficult path uh, of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a very important part, and it takes time, and that's what we're doing right now. Uh, we have problems. We have people killing uh, the former FARC members. Uh, by revenge or for other reasons. And this is a, a big challenge for the state here right now uh, to address the post-conflict pro uh, problems, which are uh, usual, are normal, but are 
completely unacceptable. So we need to persevere there. Thank you. And the last question. Um, one of the aims of our Geneva Challenge contest is to bridge the gap between academic research, practice and policy making and to give the opportunity to graduate students to contribute to the debate by proposing pragmatic solutions to advance development goals. What do you think are the right balances between research and public policy in the careers of those who care about development? And what advice would you give to our students, some of whom are about to start out their careers? Well, uh, this pandemic and the peace process in Colombia have taught me the importance of science, research, and of evidence. And uh, uh, the Colombian case is is one is a proof of the bridge between research, evidence, science, and practical solutions. And so we need to uh, strengthen that bridge. And uh, my my uh, advice to students or to the ones who would like to uh, embark in 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 these issues is um, there is no limit. Uh, think outside uh, the box. Uh, think uh, uh, that the impossible is possible. And this is something that in Colombia, because of the peace process, people told me, you're going to do something which is impossible. Uh, peace with the FARC. All my predecessors, all my predecessors, uh, wanted to make peace with the FARC and failed. But I persevered and uh, with the help of many people, we made uh, possible the impossible. That in life is very important. Have an objective, fight for it, persevere, and probably you will attain that objective. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for this wonderful address. I know that your words will inspire our students and all of us who had the chance to be here and listen to you today. And I do hope that we'll be able to welcome you in Geneva at the Graduate Institute in the not too distant future. It will be my pleasure and I thank you and congratulations for uh, this uh, program and uh, for uh, and. Uh, and I congratulate the winners uh, when they are announced. Uh, I hopefully I, I can meet them personally sometime. Thank you very much again. Thank you. We now continue with the award ceremony. Let me turn things over to Ambassador Stalin, founder of the Geneva Challenge and chair of the jury panel a strong and thoughtful supporter of our contest. Yeno, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Ladies and gentlemen, to have former President of Colombia, Manuel Santos, address us at this occasion and to hear him discuss his approach and experience fighting poverty and social exclusion is a particular honor and an extraordinary privilege. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And let me add, your presence, if only virtual, is a congenial gesture on your part for two additional reasons. First, it gives us the opportunity to remember the much admired pattern of this competition, whom you have known well, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. As you, a Nobel Prize winner, Kofi Annan had established the UN Millennium Campaign with the aim to mobilize the world around the Millennium Development Goals 
forerunner of the sustainable development goals. And secondly, because of the fact that the winning team of the first round of this competition six years ago, in 2014, was a team from Cartagena University in Bogota, Colombia. Teams from Colombia continue to play an important role in our competition in terms of numbers of participants. Colombia ranked fifth this year with 26 participants. This, in my view, is a testimony to a very vibrant intellectual climate in your country. We all know COVID-19 is a major setback to achieving the 2030 SDG agenda, and it is a challenge to the economic and social system in very many countries, and the risk for social cohesion, leading to political polarization. All the more encouraging is it to realize that this year, the number of participants in the competition has gone up again. This year, we have had 145 teams. That's the figure I've got. It may be one or two more or less. Uh, 145 teams to begin to play, comprising 558 participants, more than in any previous year. Isn't that a wonderful indication that this generation of students is committed to engage and campaign for a more equal and fairer world. I would like to thank each and all of the 558 participants for having invested time and energy in reflecting on how social exclusion has to be fought and combated. Exclusion based on race, gender, sex, sexual orientation, religion, ethnic origin, skin, social background, education, disability, nationality, age, and you name it, a good deal more. But let me add another, for me, heartening conclusion. This year, according to the numbers I've got, we have had students from 102 different nationalities registering and students from 71 nationalities competing in the conference. About half of the 145 teams are multinational, comprising students coming from more than just one country. Quite a few are composed of students from five different nationalities. Why is this an encouraging signal? Because it is an expression of multinational cooperation, cooperation across borders, at the time in which some quarters consider multinational cooperation as unnecessary, something that can it shows that amongst universities and amongst students, cooperation across national borders has become the standard way of working. As Swiss, let me add a thought in this context. In a stage three on William Tell, the legendary national hero of Switzerland, written by Rudy Schiller, William Tell proclaims, the strong man is the mightiest alone. The strong man is the strongest alone. But that happened several hundred years ago and was pronounced by a man who lived in a hamlet and not in the global history world. In this day and age, in the global world, I'm convinced that the smartest to cooperate 
to cooperate is a sign of wisdom and not weakness. Anyhow, that's my conclusion. And I'm thrilled to find out that many of the best students in the world share my mission. And with that, I would now like to move to the next stage and invite the winning team to present in two minutes, if possible, to present themselves and their projects. We start with the team from Asia. And you have the floor. A very hello, everybody. Hi. I am Pooja, uh, representing Team India, uh, sorry, Team Asia, and I am here along with my teammates Meenal, Harshal, and Anukriti. We are here to present our project, Samhit, which means uh, to be, to put together. Uh, and it's a project for uh, strengthening aid for maternal health in tribal areas. India contributes to about 12% of the global MMR with a disproportionately higher contribution from the tribal women. And uh, this is majorly because uh, tribal women are left out of the ambit of the healthcare system due to the social demographic factors and the other healthcare system challenges. So there is an urgent need to address this gap uh, between the availability and utilization of maternal healthcare services. At present, the national data is very scant and it provides only a fragmented picture of the maternal health care of tribal women. So there is an inadequate assessment of the social and cultural determinants behind the uh, health issues of the tribal women and this leads to um, it, and this leads to the pro problems and issues faced by the women. For this, we need an efficient and optimal data capturing to alleviate these problems. So Samhit, our blockchain enabled app will help in bridging this gap by aiming to include the marginalized tribal women in the healthcare system by capturing a trustworthy and quality data. Reliable information uh, is the main thing for streamlining the various channels providing the healthcare uh, system uh, in, pregn in pregnancy and post-pregnancy. So uh, Samhit ensures uh, generating valuable insights not only by capturing quality data but also analyzing the social factors which are leading to the maternal health issues in the tribal areas along with the clinical parameters. And uh, with this we ensure that tribal women get the right maternal health according strategies uh, which are according to their local needs uh, and uh, Samhit ensures that it aligns with the UN strategy to uh, help the women survive, thrive and Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, on the list now is the team from North America. You have the floor. Hey, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Ambassador Stahel and uh, Hey, everyone. My name is Will. Um, I'm a student at Harvard Medical School representing the team from North America, um, which is for Shuing and myself. Uh, our project is on building a tele digital teletherapy platform for elderly who are socially isolated to connect with their families. 
Uh, this project started out of a personal need that we share. Uh, we on the team are all very close to our grandparents, uh, but it's very difficult during our lives to stay in touch with them all the time. Not to mention now with travel restrictions and in the pandemic, uh, it's more difficult than ever before. Uh, so we created a digital platform for family caregivers to maintain a social presence in the life of their loved one, even from a distance. Uh, our platform called Gem consolidates all allows each family member, including the elderly, to record their memories of the photographs in an audio clip that goes directly on the photo. By creating a repository of annotated voice and photo memory units, our mission is to bring elderly and their families closer together, help include isolated elderly into broader society, and allow elderly to hear and see their loved ones, regardless of time, regardless of distance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Will. And now, the next team on my list is Africa. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Nafula Marvin, preaching on behalf of Vafaya's Project Africa. In the last decade, Uganda has witnessed an influx of refugees. Uganda has witnessed an influx of refugees from Burundi, South Sudan, and Democratic Republic of Congo. Russia on the available land in BDBD, the largest refugee settlement in East Africa. This continues to provoke tensions among the refugees and the host community. Additionally, poor quality and the size of plots allocated to them, kinder agricultural productivity, impeding refugee self reliance. In response to the situation, the United Nations and the Ugandan government continue to supply food rations to the refugees and the host community to ease the tension. Yet these people constantly complain that the food is insufficient and distribution is often delayed. The Vafires project aims at building the adaptive capacity of the refugees and the host community of the BD settlement to land scarcity and rocky soil through multi-story vertical farming approach. The technology is a low-cost strategy that utilizes locally available materials easy to adopt and maintain and environmentally friendly. Given funding, the project will foster intergroup relations and social integration while contributing directly and indirectly to the attainment of sustainable development goal one, no poverty, two, zero hunger, five, gender equality, eight, decent work and economic growth. 12, responsible consumption and production, 13, climate action, and 15, life on land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And on my list now is South America. Hello, everyone. I'm Thais Quiroga, and on behalf of my team, we're excited and humbled to represent South America and introduce you to our little project, Yacha. Yacha derives its name from the native Bolivian Quechua term that refers to the practice of acquiring knowledge through experience. And Yacha aims to do just that. Our project introduces an innovative and accessible program that enables community-driven knowledge sharing and a mentorship program for young Bolivians, especially disadvantaged and marginalized youth. So we have done our research and it has showed deep-rooted inequality across gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Almost 80% of Bolivians do not pursue professional degrees and youth unemployment rates are increasingly high. The snowball of problems with social inclusion start at an early age and limit opportunities for the young. As such, the program, the need for a program like Yacha is obvious. And maybe if we think about our own personal academic or professional development, I would bet that everyone here today has had someone they look up to, perhaps someone that influenced their decisions in their path, a mentor. 
And that is precisely what Yacha attempts to bring to the most marginalized Bolivian youth. Yacha tackles what we call the three E's of youth's inclusion, education, employment, and experience. To create a network of Bolivian leaders, young and old, that celebrates and fosters community-driven knowledge sharing in true Andean culture fashion. At its core, Yech is a multi-platform solution for Bolivia's age 16 to 25 who seek educational opportunities, vocational orientation, and mentorship. Yecha advances youth inclusion by facilitating inter- and intragenerational convergence and including marginalized and disadvantaged youth. Yacha is the first step in the direction towards the inclusion of Bolivia's young leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we have the last team, which is the team from Europe. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zelmek Otkontogo, and I'm representing Team Europe and our project Gearbound. Air pollution was officially declared a state emergency in the outskirts of the capital city of Mongolia, with 10% of all the deaths responsible and attributable to air pollution. Now, these air para-urban areas suffer from a variety of other complex issues, such as high unemployment, poverty, and the lack of a centralized waste management system. But the underlying root cause is the social exclusion of nomadic herders who are forced to settle in these outskirts due to a recent change in climate and increased economic pressure on their fragile nomadic lifestyle, which forces them to move into these outskirts of the capital city. The traditional top-down development aid approach has been proven to be ineffective against these complex issues, and the local change makers in Mongolia lack the financial and necessary expertise to tackle down these complex problems by themselves. They turn to their immediate network for support within Mongolia, while there is a large untapped source of support waiting outside of Mongolia. This is the Mongolian diaspora, who is well-educated, financially savvy, and possesses necessary expertise to contribute to their home country. But the contribution of the diaspora is currently limited to remittances, family, and close friends. This is why we propose Gearbound, a platform that matches these two complementary parties, local change makers with their need for funding and expertise, and the Mongolian diaspora who can fill this need. Our solution is a new type of social network platform through which the Mongolian diaspora gets a transparent overview of the local projects that they then can support via donations or through their expertise on a mentorship or task specific basis. In this way, the local change makers receive the required financial support and expertise to successfully implement and scale their projects to service the community. The diaspora receives a channel to contribute to the social development of their home country, mitigating brain drain and tying remittances to positive local impact. Gearbound literally translated means homebound, and we believe that Mongolia is not a unique case, but rather that there are many more countries suffering from similar complex problems. Our vision is to reconnect their diaspora to their respective home countries in order to empower the local change makers to contribute to the social development of their country. Thank you very much. Thank you for the team Durban. And now I have the pleasure of announcing the winners of this year's election. But let me make a preliminary remark. So the jury this year has been particularly difficult to judge and decide on the ranking because of the excellent quality of the best commissions. All of you have done a great job. I want you to know that. To introduce some suspense into the ceremony, I will start with announcing the two teams that got the third prize. Let me remind you third prize out of 145 submissions. I would like to call on the team from Africa, and I would like to ask to remember Masao Takahashi to come to the stage and inform why this project was considered one of the very best.
first of all, Team Africa, congratulations. 26 million of people are considered as refugees these days. They are displaced by the various reasons, conflict, persecution, climate change, growth, plus many other reasons. It is a major challenge for the human security. We, as a global citizen, should act together to provide not only the aid to support the immediate needs of the young people, but also to provide the economic activity and opportunity for the better life. Vertical firming in the refugee setting project, refugees project, provided the solution which overcomes the various limitations faced at a refugee setting. It unlocks the limitation of the state. It unlocks the limitation of the environment for the agriculture. It unlocks the limitation of the human capacity and the potential. It unlocks the limitation of the government and international organization. The team has successfully provided the solid multidisciplinary analysis, including the feasibility study of the agriculture, and also the, the situation analysis of the refugee camp, especially in Uganda, and also the precise action plan, including the which stakeholder to take over which responsibilities. Moreover, I would like to emphasize that the team, the project itself, has been designed to hand over the ownership to the communities for the sustainability, sustainable operation purpose. We think that the, uh, the building the uh, best practice in the early stage is a critical success factor of this project. It's because the agricultural solution normally takes long time, a long patience, and also a lot of effort for the harvest. But we are very confident that the team with a strong passion for this topic and also a strong energy to deliver these all things, the team is already ready to, uh, to endeavor this journey together with the those people in the refugee economy. Last but not least, I'd like to emphasize that the climate, recent climate change and also the population increase is constantly uh, cutting the more pressure to the food security issue. And we look forward to hear that to see the success stories in Uganda will not only inspire the other refugee settlements, but also to shape the future of the agriculture, including the urban farming in the developed countries, the developed economies. Congratulations. Thank you, Masao. The second first prize goes to the team from South America. And I would like to ask Jacques uh, Lindor to comment on this project. Thank you, Jacques. First of all, I'd like to congratulate for your outstanding proposal. Um, you underlined education, employment, and experience as key factors of social inclusion, which is something that is internationally recognized and is being addressed by your proposal, all key factors at the same time. Therefore, we as a jury thought it was an extremely relevant proposal especially for this year's uh, topic of the Geneva Challenge, social inclusion. We also thought that your proposal was um, analytically very rigorous. It was one of the only proposals that used both primary and secondary data and both qualitative and quantitative data. Combined with a clear structure and good analysis, um, we thought that the case was very well made for, for what you're suggesting um, to, uh, to implement. As a jury, we also identified some challenges, of course, um, especially around identifying and uh, motivating potential mentors and mentees. Um, but these challenges were also recognized by you as a team. And in the presentation you gave us yesterday, you developed some good ideas on how to address them. Overall, we therefore called the Yatra is a very good, innovative, 
and relevant solution to the problem of social inclusion in Bolivia. Um, and on a personal note, I would say I have also benefited several times in my life from mentoring, and I can only um, confirm how useful and important it is in one's career. And now I'm already achieving sort of the next stage where I'm starting to mentor other people. So I think um, this is an uh, amazing um, concept we're proposing, and especially the inclusive angle, um, where mentoring is not limited to specific networks or associations or types of um, sectors, but it's open to everyone and to especially excluded communities. Um, this is something that I can only recommend to support. Therefore, we really hope that you will implement your proposal. Um, and we wish you all the best in this journey. Thank you very much and congratulations again. I now have the honor to announce the two teams that get the second prize. This is the team from Asia, some who commented by Uri member Maria Luisa Silva. So on behalf of the team, I would like to congratulate the summit uh, team for your excellent proposal. Let me highlight some of the reasons which led us to grant you this uh, award today. I think the first one is the relevance of the challenge chosen. Uh, because there's nothing more representative of exclusion and discrimination than women in the 21st century that are still dying from preventable causes during pregnancy and childbirth. And this is why fighting against it became one of the eight Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, and why in 2015, heads of state and government decided to complete the task by 2030. So, but we knew that reaching those borders behind would be more difficult as they were affected by multiple causes of discrimination and exclusion. And yet, you've risen to the challenge and you have focused on saving the lives of 100,000 women that shouldn't die every year. The second reason is the analytical reason, uh, the analytical rigor and the thoroughness of your proposal. You have explored in depth the economic health, education, and cultural determinants of tribal women's situation, the structural barriers leading to their exclusion, and the systemic and administrative obstacles in India's health care system. And this scientific rigor and comprehensive examination of all aspects of the problem is the first step to success. And last but definitely not least, uh, the innovation embedded in your solution. The wish to put the very advanced blockchain at the service of the most disadvantaged, making a reality the promise of technology for global good. So thank you very much and all the best and good luck. And the second second prize is for the team from Europe. The turn is again for Maria Lisa Silva to explain the comment. So good afternoon. We were really uh, impressed with the uh, excellent quality of your submission and your presentation. And we particularly like the fact that you served thoroughly the relevant global and local sources and did not satisfy yourself with tried uh, and tested answers to the problem. I would like to highlight three particular dimensions of your proposal that I very much like. Uh, first, is the multidimensional uh, understanding and analysis of the challenge chosen. 
because you clearly state air pollution, poor sanitation and education, and discrimination and exclusion as the problems you want to address. And by doing so, you are embracing the complexity of real life exclusion problems in the way the Sustainable Development Goals ask us to do. And this makes the path for a solution more difficult, but it also makes the result much more effective. The second is the partnership approach to your solution, because your proposal builds into the efforts of many, whether community organizations, governments, diasporas, or international organizations, and tries to find and fill the gap, leveraging the collective efforts for reducing inequality in a very practical way. And it must be said that tapping into the diasporas for better local development outcomes is something that is coming purely as one of the positive contemporary trends in development and migration. And UNDP will soon be issuing a report of, of, on this. And thirdly, I must say that we were very impressed by your drive and your commitment. Your objective was not just to design a good proposal, but to make it happen. So in addition to have a very good implementation plan, in the interim time between the moment you presented the proposal to today, you've been working very hard in uh, advancing the, and taking the necessary steps by reaching out to others towards the implementation path. So we really congratulate you. I'm sure you, are, you will reach the goals that you have set for yourself. Congratulations. Well, the one theme that up to now is left without any price is the team that gets the first price. The team from North America with the project GEM. And I would like to ask to remember Masao Takahashi this year. Big congratulations. The issue associated with the aging society is a common challenge across the world, regardless of the economic stage. It is not about specific uh, issue of the specific country like Japan, China, Korea. Even you can find those challenges, common challenges in Kenya, Uganda, Bolivia, Indonesia, Mongolia, and other The project GEM, the other a teletherapy platform to connect the elderly with the family care givers presented a unique light of hope to issue to the issue that we face in the aging society by focusing on connectivity and the quality of life improvement. This project uh, uh, approaches to the, to the challenges from the three multidisciplinary perspectives. One, it focuses on the quality of life from the medical therapy perspective. Two, it demonstrates, it demonstrates how the technology can contribute to the social inclusion. And third, it fosters the human dignity and sense of care to the other, which I personally believe that this is an extremely essential topic of the current situation in the current uh, world situation. Project teams presented the ideas and the analysis in a very clear and crispy manner by showcasing the real example between US and China to talk and to explain about this issue around the world aging situation society. And also by demonstrating the effectiveness of the solution by creating the prototype and also running the field study with some of the examples of your team colleagues. And third, that it, by demonstrating the clear development plan and action items and the implementation plan um, before the scaling. We even had a kind of challenging additional Q&A talking about the digital device for the aging population, but also teams answered very pragmatic and a practical solution to step-by-step -step to tackle this issue too. 
Again, this is a very universal topic, the Asian society is challenging. We hope the award will accelerate the team's activities in the development of solutions and contribute to improve the quality of life of many more people. And also, we hope that each of you in the team members will bring the, the experience and also the wisdom that you articulate from this journey to shape the future of the humanity, including happiness, how you define the identity, what is the new role of the family, and then what is the new role of the intergenerational communication. Congratulations. In addition to that, I have the honor to announce the winner of the SDSN Youth Special Award. SDSN Youth Mission, launched by the United Nations and led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University, is to empower youth globally to create sustainable development solution. Our aim is the same, which led to an excellent cooperation between SDS and uh, uh, youth and us. In that spirit, SDS and youth have selected one project that excelled, but was not selected by the jury due to regional constraints. It is the project Rue Relief from a team comprising Russian, Tatar, and Georgian students. May I ask the team to present your project and ask then Agnes Lindblad from SDSN News to tell us why it was chosen. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, the ambassador, the jury, and esteemed audience. Uh, thank you for the invitation to attend the award ceremony. We are deeply grateful uh, to the jury for awarding our team for uh, with the SDS and Youth Special Prize. In accordance with the agenda 2030, we believe that no one in our society should be left behind. We think that people who are forced to leave their countries due to different reasons do have the right with, to live with dignity. This is why our team would like to introduce an innovative project called Blue Relief, a multifunctional system of information and service support for refugees and asylum seekers in the Russian Federation. Our solution is aimed at assisting them with integration to the Russian society, which falls beyond the scope of Russian domestic policy. The choice of the topic was driven by our common interest in studying refugee issues from different perspectives uh, by, and by the lack of information on such matters as a prime point, asylum, finding accommodation, obtain, obtaining a work permit, learning Russian, enrolling kids at schools, kindergartens. In an attempt to provide comprehensive system, assistance, we came up with a three-component system of an alliance support, unique among post-Soviet Union countries. It consists of an application, a chatbot, and a website. Uh, this uh, will solve this problem of uh, uh, information shortage. The cohesive and dynamic system where a team, uh, we are highly motivated to launch the Rural Relief Project and see the result of our work. We thank you for your attention and we are looking forward to collaborating with SDS and youth in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, the esteemed jury. And thank you, the academic committee as well. And of course, Irina of Rue Relief. Uh, it's a great honor to be a part of this ceremony and to present this incredibly prestigious award. It's an honor also for me to do so on behalf of all of SDSN Youth and the Sustainable Development Network as a whole. Uh, this year's winners, Rue Relief, represents the highest ideals of social innovation, which is, which is why we are so incredibly excited um, for them to be recognized this way. Uh, we at SDSN Youth greatly values our partnership with the Geneva Challenge, uh, and through our Youth Solutions Program, we have been working since 2015 
uh, to effectively mobilize investments, expertise, as well as visibility opportunities for youth-led innovations that are actively supporting the realization uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals, which were developed by the United Nations in 2015. In order for a project to be supported by the Sustainable Development Network, the team needs to present a unique vision with the ability to transform how things are currently being done. They need to show an integrated approach to um, to social innovation and inclusion, while also demonstrating their capability to create real and significant impact at scale. The Project Rue Relief and its team members uh, all illustrate these characteristics with great certainty, which is why we are truly so incredibly excited to have them selected for the SDSN Youth Special Prize Award 2020. Refugees and asylum seekers represent one of our world's most vulnerable population groups. As they flee their homes and all security they have ever known in their lives, they face an unsafe and challenging journey lined with great uncertainty and incomprehensible challenges. One difficult issue that governments are facing around the world is the question of integration. Rue Relief presents an innovative, compassionate and impressive solution to this very problem. Rue Relief presents a multifunctional system of information support for refugees and asylum seekers that combines a wide range of services and initiatives. The Rue Relief app provides timely assistance for the targeted category of immigrants at all stages of their stay in Russia. Um, to finish off, I would really just like to send my absolute warmest congratulations to the entire team and best of luck for the future. I cannot wait to see the great impact that you will create. Uh, I would also just like to send massive congrats to the academic committee for organizing this event so successfully, despite all the challenges we're all currently faced with. Uh, thank you. Congratulations to all the teams. Once again, you can be proud of your achievements. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no more prizes to be awarded, but many thanks to be expressed and to an announcement to be made. My heartfelt thanks go to the director of the Graduate Institute, Democracy President, Professor Manglor Salas, to my excellent colleagues from the jury, to the Academic Steering Committee, and more particularly, Professor Martina Yarenga, Yarengo, whom we have heard, and to the Secretariat, Lena sang What I would like to announce is that the six teams that have been awarded prizes will be invited to come to Geneva at the occasion of next year's award ceremony. This was impossible this year, but we hope that by then, travel restrictions will be suspended. And I look very much forward to greeting and congratulating all the teams in person and not only and solely via the screen. And the second announcement relates to the topic of 2020. One, the Diva Challenge competition, next year's competition. The topic we have chosen is the challenge of crisis management. More details on why we have chosen that topic, you will find it on our website very soon. Thank you, all of you. Be safe and healthy and all the best.
Thank <laughs> you. 